Hello, my name is David and welcome back to another episode of Ozpol Explained, where I explain all the Ozpols, every single one of them. Today we'll be exploring the question of what is the difference between a Prime Minister and a President? What can a Prime Minister actually do? What is the extent of their powers and how is that different from a President? So let's find out. The first difference is that they're not the same position with different names. Prime Ministers and Presidents aren't just interchangeable terms, although they are both elected leaders of a country, they are actually different. Presidents are heads of state and Prime Ministers are heads of government. Let's quickly delve into those two terms. Heads of state are the highest position a country has and wields executive power. A king or a queen is a type of head of state, and the president is the head of state in a republic. They are the highest step of officially passing things into law. They are separate from the houses of government and may or may not be elected, depending if they have a hereditary monarchy or if they're a republic. They also might have either a lot of political power or actually very little and may just be figureheads. It really depends on the country. The head of government, on the other hand, is the highest position in the legislative branch of a government. A prime minister is part of the houses of government, or in some countries just a single house, and they don't have powers external to the house in which they operate. Conventionally, a prime minister in Australia is whoever is the party leader of the party which holds a majority, which is more than 50% of the seats. In Australia, the Governor General acts on the behalf of the Queen as the head of state and gives royal assent to bills, allowing them to become law. The Governor General doesn't actually try to hold any political sway and although that they can actually request amendments to bills, they historically have not. In the US, however, the head of state, the President, has a lot of power and exercises it quite frequently. I'll expand on this later in the video. Another difference is it isn't always one or the other when it comes to the roles. Some countries have both a Prime Minister and a President, like France. France, you may be aware, had a little bit of a kerfuffle, a little bit of disagreement with the monarchy and um, got rid of all of them. Just, just chopped them all, just, just be gone. Just got rid of them. And so they needed a new form of head of state, which gave them a president. The US, when it had its own war of independence, went a little bit of a different route when it came to governmental structure and so just didn't have a prime minister. So prime ministers can exist under both republics and monarchies. Because Australians are probably most familiar with the position of the US president, thanks to the US being a close ally, and we consume a lot of American media, and also every single day we wake up to more and more news of what the US president has said and done, even if we really would wish not to hear that. This video will be focusing on comparing the powers and limitations of the Australian Prime Minister with the US President. This video would get just too long if I tried comparing the political system of Australia with the US as well as France and every other country, and I'm not even going to bother dissecting Bosnia-Herzegovina, which has a three-way collective presidency where the chair of the presidency rotates every eight months within their four-year term. So yeah, it's just musical chairs, I guess. Every one of them gets to be the big one. I don't know how that works. I don't understand it, but if it works, it works. Also, like, the French president, by default, is the co-prince of Andorra, despite being, you know, the result of killing monarchies. I just, I just don't have time to unpack all of that. Je suis trop fatigué pour ça. Look, I know it's disappointing to learn that not even I, your favorite political nerd, can explain every single political system in the entire world. It's so sad to know when your heroes aren't as, as big as you thought they were. But one day, one day, I will learn 
every single form of government ever created by humankind, and then I will finally achieve my final form and become unstoppable. All will bow to me and fear my knowledge of politics. But until then, we're just going to talk about US politics a little bit. So, first off, elections work differently for the two roles. Presidents have their own elections. If you've paid any attention to US elections, you've noticed that they go on for what feels like a million years and have over a thousand people competing to eventually become the nominee for a party. That sounds like a joke, but in the 2020 US presidential election, over 1,100 different people actually filed applications to run for president. And then Kanye West tweeted that he was going to do it, so I don't know, 1101 maybe? You know the old adage, anyone can become president? Um, it's not meant to be taken like presidency is a lottery, but I guess it feels like that to some people. Good luck, people. After some lengthy campaigning and fundraising, the whole country then votes specifically on which candidate becomes the president. Sort of. Basically, anyone who meets the eligibility criteria and has the support of enough rich people can become president, regardless if they are woefully unqualified and have absolutely no idea how even their own system of government works. Meanwhile, in Australia, the process is a bit more selective. You can't just run for Prime Minister. You, statistically speaking, don't even get to vote for the Prime Minister. The PM is the leader and member of a political party, so is chosen by that party, and then goes to an election like any other member. They absolutely do need to understand how government works to have raised to the ranks of a popular political party. It is then their own electorate that votes for them. This means, hypothetically, that a Prime Minister's party can win an election, but the Prime Minister themselves loses their seat. Hypothetically. It hasn't happened, but, you know, the moment that it does, I will absolutely lose it and just be yelling like, see? See? I told you, I told you it could happen. And everyone else would be like, yeah, who told us? We learned this knowledge from you, David. Thank you. In Australia, the main parties are the Liberal Party, which despite its name is conservative, and the Labour Party, which is more centre. So whoever is the leader of whichever one of these parties is most popular is likely to be the Prime Minister, unless something drastically changes, like one party dissolves and must be replaced by other factions, because those are the only two parties for the past several decades that have actually got enough numbers to form government. But you know, things change. So this also means that when a prime minister loses the faith of their party, they can be ejected from the position with a leadership spill. And we have seen this quite a lot. So you know, if there is some tyrannical, incompetent, probably very criminal, kind of just really national embarrassment train wreck of a prime minister. Um, they would just lose the position real quickly. Just, uh, you know, just as a some sort of like fail safe or something designed into the system of government. Meanwhile, in the US, apparently presidents like don't resign or get replaced or booted from their party, no matter how many scandals or how few people support them. They're just there. They, uh, once they get the position, it's incredibly difficult to remove a sitting president, even if they're quite clearly a very guilty criminal and incompetent to a dangerous extent. Uh, so, Good thing no one votes for bad people like that. I'll be talking about removal from office in more detail later in the video though, so stay tuned for that. There's also a system in the US called an electoral college. The electoral college is actually a group of individuals, or electors, that represent population groups of the states and take the votes of that area and put it towards a presidential candidate. They don't actually have to do as their population votes for. Hence the like, sort of, you vote for the president. 
you vote for your electors to vote for the president. So because of this system, that means even if a presidential candidate gets the popular vote nationwide, they can still lose because of the Electoral College. Not super sure why it works like that. But I mean, again, I can only know so much. I study Australian politics, not the US politics. This most recently happened with Donald Trump in 2016, who lost the popular vote by almost 3 million. That's the largest amount a president has ever lost the popular vote by. You know, there were less people in the past though. So, you know, if we're going by percentages of votes, then John Quincy Adams won despite 10.44% difference in the popular vote. George W. Bush also lost the popular vote in the year 2000 by half a million votes. Because of this system, the Republican Party has only won the popular vote in a US presidential election once in the past nearly 30 years, but has had three presidential terms. Some American is probably going to try and explain to me why the Electoral College is good or bad in the comments. That's fine. I'm just here to compare the systems. Why, why does it work like that? Anyway, US president serves for a maximum of two fixed four-year terms, whereas federal elections in Australia don't have fixed dates. The US president serves for a maximum of eight years since the 22nd Amendment came into effect in 1951. Meanwhile, in Australia, we don't have term limits, so Robert Menzies served for 16 years straight after World War II. He also was Prime Minister twice, so he served for a record setting over 18 years. Other countries have different term lengths. This tends to vary from, say, three to seven years around the world, and they may or may not be limited to two terms, or might be unlimited depending on the country. Again, Comparing every form of presidency is time consuming and this video is going to be long enough as it is. Next, roles and responsibilities. Both are representatives of their country and when they go to international meetings to with other world leaders like the G20, the president represents their country and the prime minister represents theirs. They both have an important role for appointing positions to government officials. The prime minister appoints ministers in their party cabinet which are positions like Minister for Defence, Minister for Indigenous Affairs, and Minister for Health. Together, they then formulate official party policy. The US president also appoints an advisory body called a cabinet to deal with the administration of the government. They also appoint the heads of over 50 independent federal commissions, like the Federal Reserve Board, and appoints federal judges and ambassadors. While the Prime Minister's cabinet is comprised of elected officials from their party, the US cabinet is comprised of people, sometimes private citizens, that the president just likes. Sometimes the president just you know, feels like they're suited for the positions. Like how Rex Tillerson was the Secretary of State for a while under Trump. The position involves dealing with things like foreign policy and Tillerson's qualifications that impressed Trump so much included working for Exxon for a few decades and being the president of the Boy Scout for two years. Now, I don't personally know how that translates over into dealing with foreign policy, but then again, I didn't take a look at Tillotson's resume, so like, what do I know? I don't know. The Prime Minister can nominate High Court judges, but it's the Governor General that appoints them. And in the US, the nominees for the Supreme Court justices can be suggested by members of Congress, and then the President nominates them and then the Senate confirms them. The Prime Minister is part of the legislation making process and can introduce bills. Bills can originate from just any party in either of the two houses in the Australian Parliament, with the exception that bills to do with money only originate in the House of Representatives. I have a video all about the differences between the Senate and the House of Representatives, by the way, if you would like to check it out. Bills must have majority approval in both houses to pass. They're then sent to the Governor General to be signed into law. The President sits separate from the Houses. In the US, bills pass Congress and then are sent to the President for final approval. The President can veto a bill if they disapprove of it. In the US, then, Congress can then override a veto by a two-thirds majority. 
in both houses. Between 1798 and 1994, presidents vetoed 2,513 bills and only 104 of those were overridden. Presidents can also personally propose a bill influencing their views on the legislation of the country. So they have a lot of power and influence as to what actually gets passed. Meanwhile, in Australia, a Prime Minister has no such equivalent veto power. If a bill gets through both houses despite the intentions of the Prime Minister, then it's just law. They can then later attempt to repeal it through another vote, but whatever caused them to lose control of the House must first be rectified. This almost never happens, by the way. However, it's pretty common for a Prime Minister and their party to propose a law only for it to be rejected by the Senate. Prime Ministers being the leader of the majority party usually maintain control and can block bills they disagree with. But this doesn't always happen. Losing control of the House happened recently in 2019 when the Medivac bill passed. The bill allowed refugees in offshore detention to receive proper medical care on the Australian mainland. Karen Phelps was giving confidence and supply to the Morrison government, but disagreed on this particular issue, so introduced a bill and helped get it passed in the House against Scott Morrison's wishes. Morrison and his coalition government were opposed to giving proper medical care to refugees on the Australian mainland, and so after the 2019 election, he repealed the bill and so made it harder for refugees to gain access to the urgent medical care that they need. The last time something happened like this was in 1941 and 1929 before that. And in the first nearly 10 years, no party actually had a majority and had to negotiate a lot with the rest of parliament to get bills passed. The prime minister, because we don't have fixed election, decides when to call an election, or at least chooses a date and then asks the Governor General to approve it, which they mostly do. I have a whole video about the role of the Governor General, by the way, which you should check out after you've finished watching this. Conventionally, the Prime Minister sits in the House of Representatives as the head of the government, though there's nothing that actually states the Prime Minister can't be in the Senate. We just, you know, we just do it that way. John Gorton was Prime Minister just after Harold Holt and he was a Senator for about a month until he quit to run in the House of Representatives in Holt's seat. This was also during like December, January, so he never actually had a sitting date where he showed up to Parliament as a Prime Minister in the Senate. So we're not entirely sure how that would work in a practical sense, but you know, Technically, there's nothing in the rule book that says a Prime Minister can't be in the Senate, and there's also nothing in the rule book that says that the Prime Minister's dog can't play basketball. So, this is why you hear me say the word conventionally nearly every single video. It's because there are so many things that we don't actually have rules for. We just do it that way because we started doing it 120 years ago. <laughs> Another difference between a president and a prime minister is that the president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, whereas in Australia that role falls to the governor-general. The governor-general and the president sometimes actually have some similarities, you know, what with that head of state thing. But in Australia the governor-general takes a far more passive role and doesn't partake in policy decisions. Let's talk about powers. Though the President and the Governor-General are commander-in-chiefs of our respective military forces, the way that we declare war is different. In the US, although the President has ultimate command over the military, it's up to Congress to declare war. Meanwhile, in Australia, there's no actual explicit circumstances defining who actually declares war. The government doesn't actually need to consult Parliament to do it, though it has in the past, and the Governor-General, despite technically being in charge, doesn't have to declare war either. The US President has this power called an executive order. Australia just doesn't have that. And to be fair, a lot of places around the world don't either. The President in the US can use an executive order to bypass Congress, though it can be challenged and later revoked by a court. Presidents around the world don't all have this exact same power. Uh, the President of the Philippines does have the power to issue executive orders. But as far as I'm aware, a lot of other countries don't have 
executive orders as a power, or if they do, it's called something else, and may have a different set of rules to them to the US system. Again, oh, too much effort. Another power that the president famously has is the power to pardon people of federal offences, so long as it's not to do with impeachment. The Australian Prime Minister can't do that. However, the Governor General can, on the advice of the Attorney General, pardon someone convicted of a Commonwealth offence, via what's called the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. This power stems from the British monarchy, so in New Zealand and Canada, for example, which are also Commonwealth countries, their respective Governor Generals can also pardon crimes. Hey, speaking of crimes, let's talk about removal from office. A Prime Minister can be removed from office in about a dozen different ways, some of which are actually so incredibly specific as to never be an issue. That being said, I do have a 43 minute long video all about this subject. It talks about every possibility, including treason, of how to remove a Prime Minister from office, so check it out after this. The main concern, though, is that conventionally a Prime Minister retains their power through a majority in the House of Representatives. It can lose this majority in multiple ways, like if a member of the party is found to be ineligible due to discovering they're a dual citizen, or they can resign, or they can die. Unfortunately, if a government loses its majority, it can be open to a motion of no confidence, which requires a majority vote in the House of Representatives to be successful. This then demonstrates that the Prime Minister has effectively lost their ability to govern. If this happens, then conventionally speaking, the government would resign and then an election would be called. This has literally never ever been successful in all of Australian history. Sorry. Speaking of never being successful in history, the US President, on the other hand, can only really be removed by impeachment. This requires a majority in the House of Representatives and then a two-thirds majority in the Senate to convict. Impeachment is a system that exists around the world, like in France, my favourite third example in this comparison video. Impeachment is a process where a legislative body charges a government official with some kind of offence, and this may result in removal from office. May. Impeachment also applies to federal judges, cabinet secretaries, and senators, etc. It's most famous in the US for the impeachments of Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump. Nixon, by the way, resigned before he could be impeached. When I say impeached, I mean the House of Representatives voted to impeach them, and then the Senate acquitted them. No US president has ever successfully been removed from office from impeachment. The system is specifically designed to make this difficult. So long as the party controls even slightly more than a third of the Senate, then it literally doesn't matter how blaringly obviously corrupt or criminally guilty or incompetent a president is. They can just hypothetically block impeachment. Good thing all US senators put their country before their party and would never subvert justice by like refusing to let witnesses speak, or just voting along party lines instead of examining any evidence in a criminal trial. That'd be just buck wild. Could you imagine? Could you? Good thing the US Senate is well known for its bipartisan cooperation, good faith discussions across party lines, and unwavering commitment to transparency and justice. Meanwhile, in Australia, if a Prime Minister commits a crime, then we do this super unique thing, uh, which is super really wild uh, now that I think about it, where like, uh, we get them taken to court, like any other person who commits a crime, and then they get a trial with a judge. Australia is just like quirky like that, I guess. If the Prime Minister or any member of parliament for that matter, is found guilty of a crime punishable of a jail sentence longer than a year, then they are removed from parliament and are ineligible to ever run again. Uh, you know, so there's like a disincentive to commit crimes, or at least disincentive to commit big crimes. You can still commit small crimes, and many politicians have, line of succession. In the USA, there's this thing called a line of succession, 
This actually exists in a few countries. Basically, if a president were to die or be impeached, (laughs) as if, then they would be incapable of being president and then the vice president would take over. Although there's never actually been a situation where both the president and vice president have died, the line of succession has over a dozen people past vice president. It goes from vice president to speaker of the house, then president pro tempore of the US Senate then to the cabinet. The US takes this line of succession very seriously, so someone on this list is randomly chosen to be the designated survivor, which means that they don't attend inaugurations or the State of the Union addresses, so to ensure that a terrorist or act of war can't obliterate the entire presidential line of succession in one go. So if some random country blows up half the cabinet, then potentially the Secretary for Agriculture could emerge from the rubble and go, oh no, I'm the president now. I wasn't expecting this. Meanwhile, in Australia, we didn't even officially have the position of Deputy Prime Minister until 1968, and even then, they don't become Prime Minister if the Prime Minister dies. They can be chosen as Acting Prime Minister if the Prime Minister is absent, like if they go overseas, but that's a temporary thing, and isn't even limited to them. Basically, any high-ranking minister can be acting prime minister if the PM goes away for a little bit. And because a party chooses their leader, if a prime minister dies, then the party just chooses from its members a replacement. There's no line of succession. If the prime minister dies, the party looks around the room and goes, hey, Who wants to be leader? You know, put your hand up, uh, and uh, please don't go for a celebratory swim. We don't want to have to do this again next week. And then they just vote on it. So what's the limit of their power? The Prime Minister only holds power so long as they have the support of their colleagues, and usually, like I keep saying, a majority of support in the House of Representatives. But usually they don't have a majority in the Senate, so they have to do a lot of negotiation or risk having bills blocked. They can also be challenged by the High Court. In the US, it's the Supreme Court that rules on whether or not laws or executive orders are legal and enforceable. Look, sometimes the courts do get involved when the president does something illegal. Amazing. Good to know. And, of course, each government is constrained by the specifics of their constitution. In the US, changing the constitution requires a two-third majority in both houses. Meanwhile, in Australia, changing the constitution requires a majority vote by the Australian public via referendum. Oh hey, I have a video about referendums. This channel is really versatile. Maybe you should, like, subscribe, I guess, or, like, send this video to all your friends and family so they can also get free education. Uh, That would be neat and it would make me happy inside my heart. Just a suggestion. Section 51 of the Australian Constitution outlines things that federal parliament is allowed to make laws on. This includes things like trade, taxation, exports, the postal service, lighthouses, Quarantine, the census, marriage, and astronomical and meteorological observations, and more. Spoilers, you're going to have to read it all yourself. I'm not entirely sure what that last one means. Um, Can the government make it illegal to look at the stars? Quick, anarchists, buy a telescope while you still can. They can also rule on weights and measures, which I think means that the federal government has the power to switch from the metric to the imperial system, but why do that when the metric system is clearly way better? What isn't the domain of the federal parliament outlined by the constitution is then for the individual states to make laws on. In the US, Article 1 of the constitution outlines the powers of Congress as well as what's denied to Congress. Congress can rule on taxes, debts, regulate commerce with foreign countries, establish post offices, and also rule on weights and measures, etc, etc. So, you know, why they haven't voted to use the vastly superior metric system is beyond me. How many furlongs in a league? Ugh. I don't know. I, I don't care. What a stupid question to ask me. Nonsense words. Oh, look at me. 
I make conversions between units really difficult because I want random numbers to be included instead of just making everything divisible by 10. I'm special. Yeah, that's what you sound like, America. Just... Bad number system. And I will not surrender an inch on this opinion. So, remember kids, constitutionally speaking, your local post office is actually an important part of the federal legislative process. They also provide pretty stamps, which is neat. Fun fact, my wife collects stamps. That's just like a, a nice thing that you know about her. I could have like a new YouTube series idea called Anna Explained, where I just explain things about my wife and how nice she is. Fun fact, she has lots of rocks and she knows lots of things about rocks. And so will tell me fun rocked facts and it's nice. And uh, pyrite is her favorite. So this like big cube of pyrite. I bought her that as a gift when I was in the US learning about not how miles work. They naturally form cubes. That wasn't like, that's, that's wild. Rocks are neat, aren't they? And so is my wife. Uh, anyway, uh, back to the video. Okay, uh, and there you have it. Uh, so to recap, presidents and prime ministers are different positions. Presidents are heads of state and prime ministers are heads of government. Presidents are elected separately from the houses of government. They both represent their countries on the world stage and they both form cabinets. The prime minister needs a majority to maintain power and can be removed from a variety of different ways whereas the president is incredibly difficult to remove from office and needs to be impeached. They also don't need a majority of their party in the house. Their powers differ with a US president having more executive power, veto powers, and can grant pardons while the prime minister has none of that. And finally, they're both limited in scope by the constitution of their countries and the high or Supreme Court can challenge their legislation. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Please comment down below what you would like to learn about next. Share, subscribe, like, comment, all those things. And there's also a Patreon in the description where you can support free education for everyone. And also a link in the description where you can get a copy of this script with all the citations I used to make it. So you can use it in assignments or just read more about this subject. Thank you so much and I will see you next time. Goodbye.